Hi students. These first three sections of the course are going to be a little bit different from what will be going forward. It's basically kind of an introduction to the course and problem solving and thinking mathematically and that type of thing. So this first section is called Thinking Mathematically. It says, mathematical thinking is important for decisions we all make every day. Possessing the ability to think mathematically makes one a better problem solver for all occasions. Reasoning is defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary as the drawing of inferences or conclusions through the use of statements offered as an explanation or justification. We begin our discussion of reasoning with inductive and deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is a line of reasoning that arrives at a general conclusion based on the observation of specific examples. Inductive reasoning can be considered a generalization. Consider this argument. In New York City, it snowed 30 inches during January 2010 and 35 inches during January 2011. Therefore, New York City will receive at least 30 inches of snow every January. Does this argument use inductive reasoning? So, the argument is very specific. It's specific to January 2010 and January 2011. And it's a very general conclusion that's been made. But, it said that inductive reasoning is a generalization. Uh, so this is an inductive argument. Obviously, it's not likely that it's going to snow the same amount every January, but it is inductive. Consider the following sequence of numbers. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. If the number pattern continues, can you conclude what the next number will be? What about the 15th number? Well, if we look at these numbers, hopefully you're already seeing a pattern here that these are perfect squares. 1 is 1 squared. 4 is 2 squared. 9 is 3 squared, 16 is 4 squared, and 25 is 5 squared. So the next number would be 6 squared or 36. And I asked, well, what would the 15th number be? Well, if the first number is 1 squared, the second is 2 squared, the third is 3 squared, and so forth, then the 15th number would be 15 squared. That's 225. A counterexample is a contradictory example that does not satisfy our conclusion, therefore making the argument invalid. Note that one counterexample is enough to prove that a line of reasoning is false. But one positive example is never enough to prove that it's true. So you can prove something is false by counterexample. But you can always have something that would be true. And, you know, just because it works once doesn't mean it's going to work all, all the time. But if it doesn't work once, then that means you can't say it's true. Consider the statement. You must have a degree in computer science to become wealthy in the computer industry. Is this a valid argument? Our book gives this reasoning. It says, for this example, we need, need look no further than the two most famous people in the computer industry. Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple Computers, and Bill Gates, co-founder of Microsoft. Neither Jobs nor Gates have a degree in computer and science yet both became quite wealthy in the industry. So this is invalid 
because we found a counterexample, a counterexample of those two people. Identify a pattern in each of the following sequences of numbers and use the established pattern to find the next term in the sequence. Okay, so we've got 4, 9, 14, 19. What do you think's happening here? Well, let's see, did I separate those? Nope. So, with 4, 9, 14, 19, let's see. I think you can probably see this already, but just in case, you can always take the second term and subtract the first. Take the third term and subtract the second. And the fourth term and subtract the third. I wrote that one wrong. This would be a 14. Or divide it, or, or add. I mean, it just depends on the situation. But in this one, if we subtract, each time we get a five. So I think it's pretty clear that each time we're adding five to get to the next. So if we add five to 19, then we will get 24. Two, six, 18, 54. Well, it's pretty clear that this is not going up by just adding because the numbers are jumping too much. So this time, I think we're going to need to divide. So let's see. We've got 6 divided by 2. That gives us 3. 18 divided by 6 also gives us 3. And let's see. Does 54 divided by 18 give us 3? It does. So we've moved from 1 to the next by multiplying by 3. 2 times 3 is 6. 6 times 3 is 18. 18 times 3 is 54. Then 54 times 3 is 162. And then the next one, we've got 5, 6, 8, 11. Let's see. From 5 to 6, we added 1. From 6 to 8, we added 2. From 8 to 11, we added 3. I think I see it. So to get the next one, we would add 4 and get 15. Lots of blank pages. When, com when the common difference between any two terms is a in a number sequence is the same, we call it an arithmetic sequence. So that first one there, where we were adding each time, that was an arithmetic sequence. And then this one, when we were multiplying each time, that's a geometric sequence, which we'll talk about too. So in arithmetic, you either add or subtract the same amount each time. A geometric, you multiply or divide the same amount each time. And there we go. A certain type of human cell re reproduces in the following manner. One cell, four cells, nine cells, 16 cells. Determine the number of cells present on the next production of cells. So let's see, it looks like we've got perfect squares again. One squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine, four squared is 16. And so the next set would be five squared, 25. Deductive reasoning is a process that begins with commonly accepted facts and logically arrives at a specific conclusion. Consider the statement, if you are a mammal, then you have lungs. How can this statement be evaluated as a deductive argument? So we're not really asked to say if this is a true statement or not. 
um, we're just asked to evaluate it. So the statement has two parts. Determining if you're a mammal and whether or not you have lungs. So in the first part, you would say, I am a mammal. And this is true. And then you would say, I have lungs. And this is true. The second statement would be, I am a mammal, again, because the if part we keep. And I do not have lungs. And we would know that to be false. So you can, in fact, say that this conclusion is, since this conclusion is false, it doesn't seem to follow logical thought. To illustrate the difference between inductive and deductive reasoning, consider the following process. Choosing a positive integer, multiplying it by 2, and adding 1 to the product will result in an odd number. Evaluate this as an inductive argument and as a deductive argument. So, to evaluate as an inductive argument, let's look at a table. So, we're just looking at some general um, examples. Let's pick the numbers 3, 6, and 8. If we do what it says, take 3 times 2 and add 1, we get 7. 6 times 2, add 1, we get 13. 8 times 2, add 1, we get 17. So it does seem, by looking at the table with these examples, that there was, this would be a true argument. But we're taking a risk here because we're just looking at a few examples. So we don't know that it would be a valid conclusion. We can't make a valid conclusion just by looking at some examples. But, oh, ran out of, if we look at part B, it says evaluate the conclusion as a deductive argument. As a deductive ar argument, we want to look at every possible number. So let's make our number a variable, x. If we multiply by 2, then our number times 2 would be 2x. And then when we add 1, we would end up with 2x plus 1. So now we've got it expressed in algebraic form. So using deductive reasoning, we know that when we multiply any number by 2, we always get an even number. And we know if we add 1 to an even number, we're always going to get an odd number. So we can use this statement which has been proven to be true with our uh, deductive reasoning and our algebraic statement, and apply it to, to specific numbers. Okay, so that concludes our first section of quantitative literacy.